Hey there! Welcome aboard the craziest journey I've ever attempted to make. Picture this, I'm deep in the hills of Kentucky, searching for a diamond in the rough. And while I did find something, I'm not quite sure I'd call it a diamond. Little did I know, I was about to take on the journey of a vehicle restoration that would change everything for me. You won't believe the incredible transformation this car is about to undergo as we bring it back to life. So buckle up, folks, because we're about to restore this 1975 Chevy Camaro. Now before we dive into the nitty gritty details, I want to share something truly special with you guys. After all the blood, sweat, and tears that I'm about to pour into this project, I've made the decision to give this Camaro away to the most deserving person that I know, my mother. This is her dream car, and while I would love to keep it and turn it into an ear-bleeding, eyelid-peeling speed demon, I'm going to keep this build a little more street-focused, but I've got a few tricks up my sleeve to still keep it interesting. I can't wait to see the look on her face when she finally gets behind the wheel of this car, so get ready for an emotional ride, because this is going to be a labor of love for somebody who truly means the world to me. So now for the big question, why am I giving my mom a car? Well, at risk of sounding a little bit sappy and cliche here, I love my mom a whole lot. And she's been there for me as an adult and obviously as a child raising me. She's supported so many of my hobbies along the way and all of my interests. And back when I first started showing an interest in working on cars, she was the one that was right up there saying, go for it, spend the money, invest in yourself, you know, work on your hobbies. It was so much support at a time that I really needed in my life to pursue something outside of my career and my work and really look at something for my free time, like a, a hobby, which was working on cars, that I feel like the best way that I could ever pay her back for that is showing her what her encouragement has led to. Now here's the most exciting part, my friends. I must confess to you, when I embarked on this restoration journey, I had zero experience working on cars. That's right, I didn't know the first thing about bodywork, welding, engine mechanics, none of it. But you know what? I saw this project as an opportunity to learn and grow and to challenge myself in ways that I had never imagined. So I devoured books, watched countless tutorial videos, and looked for guidance from experienced individuals in the field. And every day that I work on this project, I'm pushing the boundaries of my knowledge and skill set, learning bodywork and honing my welding skills and diving deep into the intricacies of what makes an engine work. Good morning, everybody. It is day one of the Camaro build on camera officially. Today's agenda is pretty busy, but the overall goal is get organized, get ready, and get going on the project. Now, I'll undoubtedly make mistakes along the way. I'm gonna find setbacks, and I'm definitely going to have moments of frustration. But with every single hurdle, I'm gonna gain invaluable knowledge and experience. This restoration project is more than just restoring a car. It's a journey of personal growth and self-discovery for me. You see, this project is not just about fixing up a car. It's about pushing myself beyond my comfort zone, embracing a new challenge, and proving that with determination and a willingness to learn, we can accomplish anything. And that's why I wanna share this journey with you guys, my amazing online family. Together, we can inspire and motivate each other to chase our dreams, no matter how daunting they seem. This project will be a testament to the fact that anyone can learn and achieve remarkable things when they have the passion and determination to do so. Now, let's talk about the state of this beast when I first found her. It was heartbreaking to say the least. The Camaro had been left abandoned in a flood, and the damage was extensive. Rust had taken hold, spreading its tendrils throughout all of the bodywork, and even the owner told me I was wasting my time. But you know what? I saw potential where other people only saw junk. Now the floors, they were a mess. Rust had eaten away at them completely, leaving huge holes and weak spots. And while the old owners did try to fix it, they were patched up with duct tape, shower sealer, yeah, the gooey black stuff that's used to waterproof showers and houses. And they even threw in a little caulk to really make sure it was fixed super well. And if you look inside here, you can see that black tar on just about every single surface on the inside of the car, even up in the footwells there, which has made this project an absolute pain to get done properly. And I knew right then and there that a full scale restoration was the 
only way to breathe life back into this car. It wouldn't be easy, but the reward would absolutely be worth it if we could pull it off. Now with all that rust, I had no choice but to remove the rusted trunk pans and floor pans. It was a meticulous process that required so much care and precision, because with each cut, I knew that any mistake could set me back significantly. Now the rust had completely eaten away at all of these vital components, leaving holes and weakened structures, and it was clear that they needed to be replaced entirely to ensure the Camaro's structural integrity was good. And so I embarked on a journey of welding, something that I had only recently begun to explore. Now, let me tell you, welding in of itself is an art form. I struggled to master the technique to achieve clean, solid welds, and to this day, I am still learning. The process demands incredible patience and precision and steady hands, and I just want to say that anyone who's really good at welding, just know you have my utmost respect. Listen, welding is not easy. I, I am realizing very quickly that welding is not easy. This takes serious, serious time and a lot of finesse to get it right. So I'm gonna be out here practicing for probably days before that trunk pan goes in. Holy cow, that's hard. I spent countless hours practicing my welding skills, learning from mistakes and seeking guidance from experienced welders. Gradually, I began to see improvement, and the welds became neater and stronger and more reliable. And I was determined to learn how to properly fix these parts, because I'm going to need this knowledge when we get to the exterior bodywork. So today, the big plan is we're going to try to put the trunk pan back in. Because once the trunk pan is in, that's kind of our proof of concept. It's on the hardest body panel to put in. So if we can get that in, then doing the floors is gonna be no sweat whatsoever. And the best part is on my list of things that I need to tackle, the floor pan is number one. And then after that is the engine rebuild. Here's our trunk pan, freshly unboxed. Still got all the little protective stuff on. I didn't even know that they do that, but that's super awesome to keep the edges from bending. We have the trunk pan fitting very nicely in here. A little bit of butt welding, a little bit of overlap welding is gonna be needed right here down the center. Uh, it does overlap. Even though I cut it, it seems to have been pushed back together in the center, but that's what you get with a lot of these aftermarket parts. They don't exactly fit perfectly. We had to do a lot of cutting. We had to cut these little pieces out for these trunk supports. I don't exactly know why those weren't molded into the original metal since it's supposed to be for this car. Um, same thing on this side, had to cut that out a little bit. Also, it was a bit of a crust update. This is what I look like right now after all that grinding, sanding, uh, cutting, everything else. It gets dirty out here in the garage. Working on cars is not all that YouTube makes it look like it is to be. All these guys look like they're working in laboratories. This is the real stuff. Now after a steep learning curve and some ugly welds, we did finally get the trunk pan welded back in. Now it's not my best work for sure, but we have a lot of room for improvement. So we moved on to the floor pans. Now is it the prettiest weld in the world? Uh, no, not by any means is it the prettiest weld but it is functional and that's what we're going for because any amount of grinding and fiberglass bondo is gonna get that nice and covered up, plus it's gonna be covered under carpet. So we don't need it to look good, we just need it to function properly. So since this is where the driver is gonna sit and I am a pretty big dude, I figure the best way that I can test it is to just sit on the panel. Eh. We're in, boys. We're sitting, and the panel did not fall out from underneath me, so we're all good. But through all the challenges of removing and replacing the rusted pans, I not only honed my welding abilities, but also gained a deeper understanding of the craftsmanship required in a car restoration. It was an experience that taught me the value of the attention to detail and the importance of taking time to do things right. Now unfortunately, when it comes to rust, I've gotten very familiar with it on this car, and the flooding definitely didn't help. Now I had already fixed the driver's side floor pan, but I had not yet fixed the passenger side, and as I was pulling the old rusty floor pans out, I found horrible frame rust. That's right, we have a rusted through frame. Now not only is the frame rusted through here on the top, but there's also a huge hole here on the side. 
And because this is approximately right where the rear suspension bolts up to the frame of the car, I definitely can't leave it like that. It's not safe, it's not secure, and I need it fixed. Now over on this side is what the frame should look more like. Solid piece on top, solid piece all along the side. And our side over here, holes on top and big hole in the side. So first I had to find out what gauge of sheet metal the original frames on these cars used. Then I went to Home Depot and bought myself a 16 gauge sheet of steel. Now 16 gauge sheet metal is super hard to bend, which is gonna make this project just a little bit harder. So very quickly after just learning how to weld, I'm already making custom patch panels. So I had to use some cardboard to find out what shapes I needed, cut them out of my actual sheet metal piece, and then start welding them into the holes that I cut in the frame. This was extremely nerve wracking because frames are nothing to mess around with. I needed this to be completely solid no matter what. Take a look at this beauty. There it is, all welded in. We didn't get the panel formed 100% perfectly, so these welds do look a little bit rough, but they are holding super solidly. Again, we're just flux core welding all of this stuff, so we're doing our absolute best. I tried to cut that little hole back in there where the parking brake cable runs through. The top of it is definitely much prettier. The side is no longer full of holes though, which is about as much as we can ask. After the metal was welded back together, I had to properly waterproof it, which required a layer of primer and a bead of seam sealer across every single welding seam that I made. This is what they're looking like right now. They are primed, they are welded in, but they need to be sealed. And we're gonna be sealing them using this seam sealer, very creative name by the way, which basically just squeezes out of the tip here and it spreads across where we've welded together panels to make sure there is a nice waterproof seal. Now most car manufacturers will do this from the factory for you, but since we just installed new pans, we need to make sure they're up to factory spec. This is gonna give us a lot of rust protection, it's gonna give us longevity protection, and even though this car is eventually going down to Florida where rust really isn't an issue, it's still a good idea to do this because there is a lot of rain in Florida. We don't have the same corrosive salt and everything that you guys up north have, so we're gonna waterproof it today and make sure that those floor pans are nice and sealed in so there are no issues in the future. As I stand here admiring the fruits of my labor, I'm filled with a sense of accomplishment because the rusted and weakened areas have been completely replaced with strong, solid foundations and the Camaro is slowly but surely coming back to life piece by piece. Now let's talk power, shall we? Or should I instead say the lack thereof because the heart of any muscle car is its engine and unfortunately, this Chevy 350 was in shambles. It had definitely seen better days, it was covered in grime and definitely showed signs of neglect. It was clear that a complete engine rebuild was gonna be necessary if we wanted to get this beast roaring back to life, but we'll get to that in a later episode. For now, we need to focus on cleaning this engine and getting all the gunk off it, so I opted to go with electrolysis as my chosen way to get everything cleaned up. We're gonna leave this thing in here for probably two or three days. It's gonna boil, it's gonna electrify, it is gonna waste my power bill, but it is gonna be totally worth it by the time this thing is done. Now, something a lot of people don't know about electrolysis, this is just a word of warning, it does release hydrogen gas, which means keep all open flames, everything else away from the reaction. Ideally, leave your garage door cracked a little bit, maybe even set up a fan, you should be good. So our first step is to pull every single thing off of the engine, all the freeze plugs, all of the pistons, all the rods, everything that is not the engine block. All we want is the engine block completely bare. That's gonna go in our big tub here and then get filled with water. In that water, we're also gonna mix in laundry booster, which will help the electrolysis reaction occur because that's what allows the water to better conduct electricity. We are also gonna need anodes, which are gonna be made out of this rebar. And that rebar is gonna be put down inside of the bin and wired together using electric fence wire. And then we're gonna blow a hell of a lot of electricity through it, which is going to pull all of the rust and the gunk and the grime off of the engine block, both the outside and the inside, which is exactly what we need because this engine had a blown head gasket and there was coolant gunk all over the inside of this engine block. All right, if it's working, we should see almost immediate bubbling from the anodes, which we are. All four of them are bubbling. 
Let me bring you in for a closer look here. Hopefully you can see that's fizzing. That one's fizzing. You can actually see some bubbles coming directly off the engine block itself and a little bubbling there, bubbling there, bubbling there and a little bubble in there. Now, as mentioned, you should always keep this area well ventilated while this is happening. So I'm gonna crack open the garage door and we're gonna leave this here for about three days and I'll see you when it's all done. Here's where we're at after about 24 hours. It's starting to get all brown and sludgy over here. And then you can see it's it's much murkier than it was when we first started, but we've still got another probably 24 to 48 more hours in here. It's still bubbling, it's still getting gross. By the time this is all done, it's gonna be filthy. All right guys, so three days later, this is what we're left with. Uh, at one point, about a day into it, I actually flipped all of the rods upside down to get the other half because once they've been in here for a while, they get really rusty and nasty and they're not as effective. So after 24 hours, we flipped them over. We let them keep running. Here's where we're at now. I'm gonna take everything off. Then we're gonna lift the block back out. We're gonna pressure wash it down and then it will be good to go for the rebuild. And these are the final results of the electrolysis. Nice and shiny on a lot of the machine surfaces here. Just from the initial bath, no cleaning whatsoever other than water and degreaser afterwards. But no brushing, no scrubbing, nothing yet. Here's the end over here, looking really good. And then even over here where we had a bunch of that grease in the corners, that's all come off, which means that this thing is almost ready. So with so many odd things going on with this car, I decided to reach out to the old owners to see if I could find out a little bit more information about what this car was used for, what happened to it, and why it's in the state that it currently is. Because up until this point, I have no idea why this car is in such bad condition. Now back in the day with all the options that this car had, it would have sold for about $3,700. 3000 700 and that's not a lot in today's standards you think about what $3,700 gets you today that's probably about what four tanks of gas <laughs> I bought it for $3,000 up in the middle of nowhere here in Kentucky and that brings me to the crazy history that this car has had and what led it to coming into my possession for only $3,000 now initially when I purchased the car I drove four hours north into the middle of eastern Kentucky and I met a nice fellow who sold it to me who said that he was the original owner he then sold it to someone else who then sold it back to him and I always found that really weird that you would sell a car to somebody and then a few months later have it sold back to you usually that would signify that something is wrong with the vehicle and they didn't want the purchase anymore however as I've started tearing this thing apart I found a lot of evidence that suggests that this car may have actually been involved in one of the historic Kentucky floods now, if you're not familiar with the area up here in Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky floods a lot. You maybe would have heard of it last year when they were talking about the big hazard Kentucky floods, and that's only about half an hour south of where I bought this car. And I've even personally seen flooding that is three, four feet high, and that could easily total out a car. So I gave the owner a call and I wanted to see if my theory was correct. And they told me that when they sold the car to this other guy, he had it for a couple months and there was a giant flood in the area, exactly what I was thinking. The car was essentially totaled out in the flood. It had gotten sunk down in some mud. Uh, it was up to its windows and water basically. And he didn't want the car anymore, but he didn't want to total it through insurance because he didn't have any at the time. So he sold it back to the original owner who then decided to fix the car. And you know what, it, it was running and driving when I purchased it, so I'll give him credit where credit's due. Usually a flooded car can be pretty hard to revive from that state. But there were signs of water in the oil and in the power steering pump, 
And that was kind of my first clue that there might have been some water issues with this car. And all throughout the process of tearing this apart, I found more and more evidence that backs this story up. There's been mud caked between the frame rails and the bottom of the car, which would signify where it was stuck down in the mud during the flood. There's been sand and dirt up inside of the frame that I've cleaned out. There was sand inside the cabin of the car when I first got it and cleaned everything out of it. And there were some weird places that have been rusted out that are now patched in and fixed that you don't normally see rusting out, like up underneath the rear frame rails, which would again signify that water got up there during the flood. And that brings us to the current stage of the restoration. We've only just barely scratched the surface of this, but we've repaired the floors, we've repaired the trunk, we've repaired the frame, and we've got our engine block cleaned up and ready for its rebuild. Now the rest of this build is gonna take a lot of time, so make sure you stay tuned, subscribe, like, and turn your notification bell on so you do not miss a single episode of this project because it is going to be crazy. So stay tuned for the next episode where we go deep into the engine rebuild and get this old car running again. Will we find more problems and secrets along the way of this build? Almost guaranteed. But I'm excited to have you guys by my side every step of the way. So I'll see you soon in the next episode of the rebuild of this 75 Chevy Camaro. See ya!